evening's exhibition shows, and we've seen a uh, recent growth in scholarly skirts, scholarly circles, um, even a recently commissioned opera. The legacy of David Jones is very much one in the making, but he has long been recognized by many, however, as one of the most extraordinary artists of the 20th century. Jim Ede, who is the once curator of the Tate Modern and creator of Kettles Yard, Cambridge, which of course is just a stone's throw from here, not sure in which direction. Um, he spoke of him, of Jones in 1940, as quote, not only the best watercolorist working in Great Britain today, but by far the best engraver, a poet and writer of genius, and all a most imaginative artist. And Jones worked, of course, across with excellence across this extraordinary range of mediums. And tonight, we're just focusing on his wood engravings, inspired by the theme of um, this exhibit on the minor, minor prophets. And one of these works in particular that I'm standing next to, you'll have to come and see after um, the poetry reading from the, book of, from the Book of Jonah. So Jones took up wood engraving um, in the early 1920s and quickly became one of the finest engravers in Britain. And he was commissioned by Golden Cockerel Press to create a series of illustrations for several books that were produced on handmade on handmade press and handmade paper. This press, together with members of the Society of Wood Engravers, embraced book production as a political and social intervention, perceiving their post World War I Britain as one increasingly driven by commercialism, efficiency and speed above all else. Even the arts and crafts movement, which had in the 19th century and in response to an industrialized and automated Britain, sought to salvage the making of artifacts as essentially a human activity, as a practice and not merely a production. But this movement, even by this time, had become a factory-based commercial industry. For these artisans, human artifacts and the technologies with which we make them are never neutral, but potent mirrors and actively shaping our relationships with one another, other creatures, and the divine. So the Book of Jonah was the first of these, these three um, books that he made during this period. And it, he began it in Capelafin, where the Gill family had moved after the breakup um, of Pepler and Gill at Ditchling. And it was in Wales where Jones says he found his unique kind of or carpentry of song. It was as though it was arising from the hills and the rivers themselves. This, this is him speaking um, quite late in his life. He says, well, it would seem to me that round about 1924, I was at last understanding the particular carpentry which most served with my inclinations and limitations. Because at this propitious time, the circumstances occasioned my living in Nanthamthu, the Hanthu Valley, there to feel the impact of the strong hill rhythms, the bright counter rhythms of the rivers of water, which makes so much of Wales a pluribel. This inaugurated his most industrious period and by the late 1920s, Jones would complete illustrations for, from engraved wood blocks for the story of Jonah, Noah and the Flood, as told in this medieval, um, medieval, chess, medieval play, Chester play of the Deluge, and later in the medium of copper engravings for Coleridge's poem, The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. The commonality in subject matter across these three major projects is revealing. Each tells an epic voyage of descent and ascent in which the principal char characters undergo severe trial, all notably trials by water, as the passage to redemption. Now, Jones's attraction to these stories was not an abstract one, but profoundly personal, having crossed the Strait of Dover only a few years earlier as a soldier in World War I, by misadventure, as he would later characterize it, and he would increasingly, increasingly suffer in its wake. It was also, however, during this time at war, when, as Jones accounts, he became inside a Catholic, having witnessed a makeshift mass not far from the trench line. 
In search of wood, to fire, to keep warm, he wandered from the trenches and came across a dilapidated barn and pressed his eye against a crack in the wall, discovered to his surprise the warm glow of candlelight. A couple of toughs, as he calls them, or soldiers kneeling, receiving the consecrated cup and bread. This small ramshackle place became one of epiphany for Jones, and it would illumine his life all the, the rest of his life and work to come. On return from war, he formally converted um, to, Catholic, to, to the Catholic Church and under the guidance of Father John O'Connor joined the community at Ditchling in Sussex for a time. Jones was seeking for integration for his vocation as an artist, knowing that what he glimpsed in the mass demanded more than what his art school training could, could deliver him. And this is what we begin to see, I think, working out in particular through these, these series of engraved illustrations. In Jones's introduction to Coleridge's poem, The Ancient Mariner, he reflects on what he calls the trope of Christ the Mariner in this way. What is pleaded in the mass is precisely the argosy or voyage of the Redeemer, his entire sufferings, death, resurrection, and ascension. It is this that is offered on behalf of us Argonauts and the whole argosy of mankind, and indeed in some sense of all earthly creation, which, as Paul says, suffers a common travail. As Jones's poetry and visual art attest, he gradually yet daringly explored what it means to read not only these biblical stories, but his own, and indeed all creation, in light of the argosy of the Redeemer. In the book of Jonah, this Christological typology is drawn on throughout, and you can see kind of hints of that in, in some of those um, images on the handout. And it was, um, Jones became, um, he had learned this craft of wood engraving. If you can pick up on one of those images, um, it's the first of the, the first plate of the book of Jonah where there's um, an angel, the Saint Gabriel, meet, greeting Jonah. And you can see here his phenomenal incorporation of two different kinds of wood engraving. So one was um, came into um, really prominence in this early early 20th century, but it was first discovered really by someone named Tom Buick in um, the, the late 18th century. And it revolutionized the way that wood engraving um, was done. So prior to this, um, and you can see an example of this on the um, figure of the angel. There's a technique that's almost more like drawing on paper that's been applied onto wood. So you see this kind of black line that creates the figures that, that are present. And that's created by this carving away of the wood on either side of the line so that when the wood block is printed with ink, that black ink hits the upraised point of the of the wood block, and it's used usually like a kind of a scalpel. Whereas this black line wood engraving was so revolutionary, um, and yeah, love to go into more details about it. It's quite fascinating. But it uses instead of the long grain cut of wood, it uses the end grain cut of the wood. So if you have a, a piece of wood and, and cut it off in the end, it's that circular round bit that's that's exposed. And it would, they would usually use boxwood or very, very hard, tough kinds of wood. Like boxwood was apparently almost as tough as ivory. And this was essential because this way, the engraver would have these instruments with all sorts of fun names like spit stickers and things like this that would sit more like cradles in the palm of one's hand and run um, alongside or flush with the wood. Um, and the, the artist would move the wood block around and keep his hand fairly steady and create these lines within the wood itself. So there's the sense of being integrated with the material of the wood itself and has much more capacity for um, these fine lines and these details that you see in these different textures coming out in, that, um, in those aspects of the drawing where you can see where that white line um, is. is um, just, I wish I had a... Wish I had one of these in front of you so I could see. Yeah, so you can see the angel's wings would be in that black line technique, or the city of Nineveh in the background 
as well. And of course, those two images in the top um, from the Chester play of the Deluge are all in, in this black line um, technique. So also in this book of Jonah, we see Jones kind of breaking from the faux naive primitive Christian style practice at Ditchling and incorporating this perspectives of continental modernism. And I think that really comes through, especially through the city of Nineveh, um, where you see this kind of cubism almost kind of um, coming through. Hilary Pepler spoke of Jones as an engraver this way. He said, Jones had the grace to love the wood and the feel of it. All his work has that fine quality of cooperation between artist and material. Eric Gill, he continues, imposes his will on wood and stone alike. But David Jones discerns the nature of the substances he handles and brings their life into his own. Now it's this relation that Pepler is so beautifully expressing there between um, his, Jones is, as an artist, his own life and the life of the material with which he's working um, that are also seen, I think, I can trace out a little bit in commonalities across these three works of Jonah and the, of Noah and the Ancient Mariner through, first of all, this element of water that figures so prominently in all of them. So water in Jones's work bears perhaps the greatest analogical breadth um, of any of these material elements that he spends time, time with and um, works with in, incorporates into his poetry. And um, Jeremy, Jeremy Hooker aptly summarizes the significance of this element for Jones by saying, water is this uniting of the historical, physical, mythological, or religious meanings of the voyage. It is life-giving under all these forms, and as both element and sign, it carries this complex but unified significance. So from the physical waters which surround and define the British Isles, this patient creature of water, as Jones describes it in his poetry, that forms the landscape we live in, to the intimate waters of the womb, to the baptismal waters, and the water mixed with wine in the Eucharist, Water, like light for Jones, is a living creature, a participant in and conduit for this passage between the materiality, temporal, and the unseen or the internal, or eternal, this unifying place. So he writes uh, in one of these footnotes that Dominic mentioned in the Anathemata, where he can go on for quite a bit. He, he, he speaks about this, um, he speaks of water as... Um, in, in the poem itself, he, it's an image of Christ on the cross, and it's a lament, and the, those that are joining in the lament are the naiads and all of these fairy creatures, water, those that are guardians of these places, um, these special water wells throughout Wales and, and the, the rest of the British Isles, and they're all crying for the fountain, the fountain, as he says it, is now thirsty. And what are they? What are they to do in this space? And he writes on a note to this um, of this the fountain of the sign stream. It says the entire sign world, to which the metaphor of water flowing from a common source could apply, is one of his uses of this um, of this in his poem. To the actual streams are rivers which are themselves signs of conveyance and themselves physically convey, which not only provide the metaphors, but the physical stuff without which the sacraments could not be. So he's always taking us back into this rootedness in the material and the creaturely. And another image um, or another commonality across these that, that, that is... Um, I think brings out this similar emphasis on the creaturely in his work are the animals that all play such a key role. So we have the dove, of course, the, the, the animals that enter the ark two by two are beautifully celebrated in that um, image that he, in that first engraving on your, um, on your handout. You have the dove who brings the, um, the, the sign of peace after the waters have ceased. Um, and of course, you have the albatross and the ancient mariner. 
and in Jonah, this mighty sea creatures, this mighty sea creature. It's not just, um, as in Coleridge's poem, his, Coleridge's last stanza that Jones illustrated, um, reads, he that prayeth well, loveth well, both man and bird and beast. I would say for Jones, it's that bird and beast, like the wind and the waves, may indeed at times pray better than human beings themselves and are our teachers, like the lilies and the birds in the Matthew 6 gospel passage. There's a, he, he recalls this Christmas carol and a message he delivered in 1960 on the BBC. Um, he recalls this carol that reads, Animals all as it befell, who were the first to cry, Noel. He carries on, a piece of charming medieval, fa medieval fancy may be, but if we forget the animals, we are halfway to forgetting the creaturely in ourselves and that in turn will impoverish the sacramental in us. No wonder, he continues, the theologian most associated with the angelic hierarchies should have declared that having our having bodies is an advantage. Of course, there I think he's alluding to Aquinas who has a slightly special place <laughs> in this community. And you'll also want to notice um, where Sister Rose is, is standing right behind her is a beautiful um, Christmas card that he created for Faber and Faber that's both an inscription and um, an, a, a drawing as well. The inscription reads, um, Sing heaven imperial, most high regions of air make harmony. All fish in flood and fowl in flight be mirthful and make melody. Human beings for, D for Jones, all have their artist, all have the vocation of being artists in this way, of moving and living in the material world in such a way that one listens to its deeper harmonies and deeper connections and is filled with the passion and the desire to represent that, to draw that out, to make it sound anew in different forms. But of course, Jones was struggling with a crisis that we were losing this sense of our rootedness in, in the creaturely and our calling to, um, re, to, to create with gratitude through these things uh, by which and through which we make our dwellings and discover our di dignity and our divinity as well. And some, I think one of those, that crisis actually is really beautifully depicted powerfully um, and difficultly depicted really in the last image, um, the last frontis or the last, sorry, um, illustration that he made for the book of Jonah, which I'm standing next to here. And I think this is up, is tilted actually, I think it needs to be. So yeah, so it actually, <laughs> actually hangs this sorry. way. No, I didn't know it was there until just now. So it's an image of, of Jonah really painting. <laughs> Right. But it is really interesting that it's so the other way. So this, this way. So he's actually falling. Yeah, that's brilliant. Wow, that actually illustrated my point really well. <laughs> so he is, the artist isn't standing upright. He's actually falling over. He's fainting. Um, and so, of course, this is an image of Jonah um, at, at the very end of, of the prophet story when he's essentially been... Um, he's failed essentially or he's, he's the Lord's mercy has been shown through his message almost entirely despite himself um, so this, this image has the prophet falling over and he's suspended between this intense light of the sun beaming down on him and below him is this as Jones describes it in one of his um, lamenting poems of the modern world, perfected steel and glassy towers mm -hmm. that lack the sense of the creaturely. And he's suspended between, between these two um, spaces. Mm -hmm. But for, for Jones, even I think these most, he has this incredible capacity to represent places of despair without shying away in any way, without 
sugarcoating it in any way. And it's by going that deep into those places of despair that somehow, he says, praise inevitably sings in that, in that place. And it's in this place of the artist, of the, the prophet here, being entirely dispossessed of himself. He's no longer the owner you know, of, of, of the message. So you can see these holy beads that are falling on the side, I think in um, all of the previous images. He's still got a hold of these, um, these prayer beads. And now, at last, even they have fallen on the side. Um, sorry, a little bit more about thoughts. Um, yeah, so in his poem, Ah, 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 Domine Deus, it ends in a similar... Um, in a similar moment of defeat where he, the, the, the poet is looking around in the modern city and looking for things, these, this sense of the creaturely in things, and he can't find them. Um, the shiny, the, the chic um, is no longer singing to him, and he can't find the inspiration that he needs. And he finally cries out after a moment of silence, Ea Domine Deus. And in this Ea, that Domine Deus, this word, this um, Latin transliteration of the holy name, the divine name, that is no name, that is unutterable, um, of Yahweh, this mysterious I am that is at the heart of being. Um, the Ea is an echoing, if one hears, one begins to hear the praise, um, the Ehie, I am, and it's this that's singing through the poet despite himself and in, in and through even his own failure. So we can yeah, speak more about that. But just to close with um, thinking about um, this artifact that is the oldest artifact in the British Museum that dates to around about 11,000 BC. So this is toward the end of the last Ice Age um, called the Magdalenian Era. So this is the kind of artifact Jones would have loved had he known about it, and perhaps he, he would have done. It's the form of two reindeer, a male and a female, swimming across a river in a chain-like formation that have been delicately carved from the narrow length of a mammoth tusk. The upward tilts of the heart and hind and their outstretched limbs create, as curator Neil McGregor remarked, a marvelous impression of streamlined movement. The skillful engraving reveals ribs and sternum, a full set of antlers, and the texture of full coats. These details convey even the time of this couple's crossing as autumn, another in-between time, marking the turn from summer to winter. For the Paleolithic artist or artists who made this engraving, Autumn meant preparation for the freezing winter months, and reindeer were essential to their survival. And yet, springing up from such harsh conditions is this gratuitous sign, a masterpiece of craftsmanship, revealing a powerful imagination and sympathetic engagement with the forces and of life and death all around them. As Rowan Williams, in commenting on this artifact, remarks, you can feel that somebody is making this, who is projecting themselves with huge imaginative generosity into the world around, and saw and felt in their bones that rhythm, mm -hmm. trying to enter fully into the flow of life around them. This evolving capacity to imaginatively enter the patterns and processes of the material world, Williams is suggesting, is at the same time the capacity to enter the sacred. Art and religion, he reflects, may be in the modern world or seem in the modern world deeply alienated from another, from one another. But this testimony from the ancients is quite other. His theological point is clear. The religious impulse in humanity does not originate in a flight from the world of nature, but takes root in these processes and acts by which we become more incarnate, more at one with the world around us. As human beings discover their capacity to create, he suggests, 
so do do they begin to discover their creator, the supreme artist. As Catherine Pickstock has elegantly argued, our attempt to return to our divine origin is not so much a journey towards God as a journey towards God's entry into our body. Or to hearken back to Kathleen Raine's beautiful summary of Jones's artistic vision, while so many moderns redissolve man into the cosmos, with David Jones it is quite the contrary. For him, the whole cosmos is made human in this way, when God puts on our human flesh, which is of one substance with the bear and the thick-felled cave fauna and the older creaturely dinosaur and unabiding rock and the terra marl from which we are all made. Incarnational was perhaps for David the most significant word of all. What is capable of being loved and known is God incarnate. Thank you.